Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. This episode of the Human Experience Podcast is brought to you by Fine Mindfulness. Mindfulness these days is huge. Mass media is starting to understand the benefits of taking time to pause and reflect. Have you ever been interested in mindfulness and meditation? Have you ever wanted to create a practice, but you just fall off track? Well, this is where Fine Mindfulness comes in. They offer a community that will help you create those powerful lasting habits that keep you training your mind. Whether you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a college student running a startup, Find Mindfulness can help you. Find Mindfulness is a 30 day program. How often are you looking at your cell phone? Just ask yourself how often you look at your cell phone and then tell yourself that you need to take this course. Mention the human experience. Go and sign up right now at www.findmindfulness.com. What's up, folks? We are here with yet another brilliantly crafted episode for you guys. In this episode, we spoke to Mr. Peter Panagor. He has quite the story to tell. He has been canvassing these various radio programs. He's appeared on NBC to tell the story. And when you're finished listening to this episode, you'll find out why. This was a fun episode. Peter is super easy to speak to just a really warm hearted human being i highly suggest that you check out his book heaven is beautiful how dying taught me that death is just the beginning otherwise please make sure you get to our facebook page give us a like subscribe to us on youtube follow us on twitter at the human xp if you enjoy the content and you want us to do more shows, get to the member section of our site, thehumanxp.com, become a member. It's five bucks a month, which is the equivalent of the cost of a cup of coffee. It tells us that you actually care about what we're doing here, but I digress. Thank you guys so much for listening. The human experience is blasting through the Byzantine conduit in your brain, making the drums in your ears vibrate as we transition into the afterlife with my guest, Mr. Peter Panagor. Peter, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Thank you very, very much. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Xavier. Peter, your your story is harrowing. Your book had me turning pages. I mean, I flew through your book, but let's set a premise. Let's create the stage for your story and start with your education. Where did you go to school? Xavier, I went to St. John's High School in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, which is where I learned how to meditate from my senior year religion teacher who had gone off to a monastery nearby and come back with this lesson that began my whole life as a meditator. And then after that, I went off to the University of Massachusetts, where I studied English literature. And I spent a year at Montana State University on exchange. And then I did my graduate degree, a master's in divinity at Yale University. Okay. All right. So, I mean, you, I mean, we're, we're talking about death here. I mean, this is the, this is the fundamental thing that we share beyond religion, race, creed, 
geographical location. I mean, invariably, we are all going to die. So, I mean, you're you're. Let's talk a little bit about your your fascination with ice climbing because that's how this this experience all started for you. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about ice climbing? What is involved and kind of how it works? My fascination with ice climbing was short lived. I had one climb. My real fascination was with mountaineering, uh, technical climbing, and backpacking. But I found myself with an opportunity to try myself on ice. And so what was involved were the skills that I'd already developed as a technical climber, ropes and harnesses and concentration of my fear into courage so that I would pay attention to exactly what I was doing. Ice climbing is like a, a single-minded sport where at any moment you know that something terrible could happen and if it does happen some the end result could be the end of yourself and so that type of sporting experience focuses the mind in a meditative way it makes you single-minded and that's what really attracted me to it I, I wanted to prove to myself that I had the the inner fortitude uh, to focus my brain and strength to ignore the possibility of death. I mean, this is a highly dangerous activity, sport, right? It is. It's, it's, it's fewer people get hurt ice climbing than playing football. In football, everybody gets hurt. And ice climbing, some people get hurt. Um, so on a percentage basis, it's not quite as dangerous as football. But the difference is, is that you tend to, people tend to die ice climbing as opposed to in football. So, so okay. So at the beginning of the 1980s, you embarked on an ice climbing trip that, to put mildly, didn't go quite to plan and had consequences for the rest of your life, including writing this book that detailed your experience. What happened on that day and, and how did it affect you? I'd been out on a an eight-day backcountry snow caving experience with my climbing partner, Tim, a fellow that I got to know very well on this backcountry experience, but previously didn't know at all. We had planned this trip together, but we got together because of the opportunity to take this trip together. So we'd only known each other about a month before we headed out into British Columbia and Alberta. And we finished our trip with a one-day ice climb. And Tim, my partner, was an a lead climber, uh, technical on rock and on ice. And I was a technical climber, but I'd never been ice climbing before. I talked Tim into thinking that I could do it because I'd done so much rock before. And it's true, I could do it. And I did do it. But I made a bravado, cocky, 21-year-old choice of, <laughs> on my equipment. I, I chose to use an ice axe and a hammer. There are unequal length and you really need two hammers um well like you need a hole in the head i had one hanging from my belt and one in my hand what you really actually needed was one hammer and two axes but i didn't have two axes i had two hammers and one axe and the way that the axe works is that it has a a shaft right and has a like a hummingbird beak on one end and a on on the top and a like a blade from a an adz on the other, mm -hmm. that hummingbird, and you, you plant the hummingbird end of it into the ice and you take the shaft, which has a pinion at the bottom, and you drop that into the ice and it creates a 45 degree angle mm -hmm. with the hypotenuse. And there's a strap midway up the, the shaft, maybe a third of the way up through a ring. And you can put your hand through this uh, loop that's attached to the shaft and slide a bead down the uh, the loop to lock your hand in so you could actually let go of the axe. You can plant the axe, let go of the axe, and dangle on the axe by opening your hand up a little bit and re rest your arm. That's the way it works. That's what I did with one arm. The other arm, I used this much shorter hammer that uh, when you plant it in the ice, it sets the same way at a 45 degree angle, but the strap is on the bottom of the shaft. And so you, if you dangle on it, it automatically pulls the hammer off of the ice. So all, what that meant was that I couldn't rest. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't rest, 
I burned myself out rapidly. And it was, it, uh, Tim, Tim told me it wasn't a great idea, but we both thought I could do it. And I did do it. I, we successfully climbed this. It was, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that it took us so much longer because I was so exhausted because I used this hammer. But that by the time we reached the top of our climb, it was sunset and all the other teams on this climb had already left the ice and the stragglers were leaving to the parking lot. Okay, let's let's fast forward a little bit and you know, what was that point in your mind where you kind of had this knowing, okay, um I'm about to die. Well, the first point happened when we were at the top of the climb and we realized that we were in serious trouble and if we stayed where we were, which we discussed, that we were going to die there. And so we decided that our best chance of survival was to try to get off the ice uh, or die trying. We knew we would die. We decided that we would struggle so that we might not die. But the, the moment came when we had forced our way across and down the mountain face to our last rappel. We we're about 150 feet up. And I had gone through the stages of hypothermia to the point of being hot and then to the point of falling asleep. And between the point of being hot and falling asleep, with the rope around the corner um, jammed uh, in, a, in a place that I couldn't get to, I had one bitter end, which is the end of the climbing rope, tying to my harness, and I dropped the other bitter end so that I could pull it through the, the eye ring that was way up the mountain. And this was this was in Canada, right? You guys were climbing in Manitoba, Canada. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, uh, no, that's right. It wasn't Manitoba. It was north of Banff, kind of northwest of Banff, and south of Jasper and Alberta. And it was March, and there was ten feet of snow on the ground, and it was wicked cold. Uh, it was it was very very cold, and you know, cold can kill you. And I, it wasn't something I didn't know. I, I knew that I'd I'd been on ski patrol since I was a maybe a sophomore or a freshman in high school and had experience, uh, uh, training and experience with removing people from my mountains when they had frostbite and hypothermia. It wasn't the first time I'd seen it. Well, first time I'd seen it in myself though. So okay. So you're, you're on this rappel, you're going 150 feet down, you're with Tim. Um, and that, is the second time that you realized there's something deeply wrong or? Oh, no, no. The, the, this was the third rappel too. Um, I sped you up to the, to the last position we were in. Okay. We had, we had gone from the very top of the mountain uh, through a harrowing evening of uh, violent shakes. Uh, the rope became a 300-foot knot. We descended from our first rappel and the rope froze in position up above us. We couldn't get it free. Tim tried to reascend up uh, on a f on a free ascent with no protection from a fall on the rope off the rock, like shimming, sort of shimming up the rope. That's not an exact um, description. He was using certain types of knots, hitches actually that that were friction based. But once we retrieved the rope from that, we then traversed across to our next rappel, which we descended. Uh, to the last rappel, which is where this story really begins for me in terms of my end. Mm -hmm. And we were on this um, ledge 150 feet up. It was a couple hours before sunup. The temperature was very cold. The moon was about three quarters. It had come across the sky. We could see almost in color because of the moon, but there's still a million stars overhead of every brilliant color. And mm -hmm. I could see off in the distance the Columbia Glacier, and I had I had gotten warm, as I mentioned, and had unzipped my coat, and I knew that that was a bad sign. All all the blood rushes into the core of the body in order to protect the essential elements, and I knew that the rope was stuck, and I knew we were done. That's really what happened. I I became resigned and even peaceful thinking to myself that it was a beautiful place to die and that I was not going to get out of this and that my parents and my siblings were going to suffer as a result, but there was nothing more that I could do. And so I began to fall asleep and 
would fall off my perch and climb myself back up to my perch again when I after I hit the rock because I was harnessed in. And I wasn't really paying attention to Tim at this point. I was mostly in my own world. And mm-hmm. and that repeated a few times until this last time when I was standing on the ledge again and I watched the world fade to black like the end of a of an old time movie. I watched my peripheral vision circle in on me and I wondered what was going on. I'd never seen anything like it before. And I, I thought to myself, this is, this is it. And I, I remember falling, but I don't remember hitting the rock. I, and I remember thinking, why am I not asleep? Why am I still conscious? So your, your body fell? My body fell. I was harnessed in. There's an iron pin and an iron ring in the mountain that I was clipped into. So I fell only a couple feet every time I fell off of this ledge. Wow. I fell a bunch. Um, but I wasn't going to fall and hit the ground. I, I, what I figured was going to happen is is that I was going to be found. So early early in the night, in the evening before, uh, on, after our second rappel, the warden, uh, provincial park warden, where we had signed in to hit the log because we were going into a wilderness area, came looking for us. We, he knew that we were on this climb. Uh, the climb wasn't very far off the Ice Palisades Highway. There was a parking lot across the street, middle of nowhere, like seriously, maybe one person per square mile. <laughs> you know, it's like nobody's there. And um, he had parked across the street after our, when we got down to our first rappel uh, to the bottom of the first time. And we were, we had lost our coordination. Uh, which is a uh, hypothermic thing. We were losing the ability to think clearly, a confusion, and our lips and our jaws were freezing as well, so we could hardly speak. But he came and we saw him across the street. We assumed that it was him. And um, we jumped up and down against the ice. He could see us. He flashed his lights and we waved. And that gave us heart to continue Mm -hmm. off to the next rappel, which was down this dark crag. Um, out of the moonlight around the corner onto this ledge where we now stood. Um, so I thought as as I was dying, as I was beginning to die, that the warden would find me the next day dangling. Or the, or the, or the early teams, the teams that, that got there first would see me and probably Tim dangling from our harnesses frozen. Uh, mm-hmm. Wow. All right. Let's, let's keep going, man. I mean... Oh. Um, so uh, the, the world had faded to black for me, and I had fallen, and I, I didn't lose consciousness. Every time I fell asleep, I fell asleep, you know, and I, what woke me up was I smacked into the mountain. But this time when I fell, I felt myself fall, but I didn't feel myself hit the mountain, and I still had, was awake, and I remember wondering, why am I still awake? And, and then suddenly I could see through the mountain, although I knew my eyes were closed. I could see through the mountain and I could see a vastness. And in this vastness, this darkness, a amorphous, gray, black being that was immense rushed toward me like, like, like a, a tidal wave, like a, the wall of a, a, of a river broken from a dam, rushed right toward me. And, it, and I knew that it had intelligence and intent because it communicated to me that it was going to take me. And wow. I knew very clearly that, that it wanted me. And it was so infinitely powerful. I, I, I didn't want to go. I put up my willpower against it to block it. And I'd spent all night being driven towards survival. And for anyone who's in the listening audience who's ever been in a, a real serious survival situation, you will know what it's like to dig ever deeper and discover inside yourself uh, a huge amount of willpower to survive against all the odds. And I put that barrier up against this, this intent to take me, but it took me anyway as if I was just a little twig in a river. <laughs> and, and the next thing I knew, I was in this infinite darkness that was also illuminated. I, and I, I could see in every direction but I didn't have any eyes and I didn't have a body and I didn't have a brain. And I remember thinking that 
that because I didn't have a brain, I was thinking so much clearer and so much faster and that I had so much more knowledge that I didn't understand where it had come from. Um, and in front of me was a gigantic door, like a darkness, uh, but the darkness was translucent and transparent. And there was the proverbial tunnel, which was darker than the greater darkness. And I reached out with my being and I touched this translucent and transparent flow. It was like a shimmer, like a river flowing down. And, and it was living. And, and, and it was this paradox. I, I, I could see that it was, I, I could see it was both transparent and translucent, but it didn't really disturb me that, that it was so. And when I touched it, it had life in it. And when I touched it, I heard my name from deep down inside me erupt. And it wasn't my name, Peter. It was the, the ground of the essence of my beingness. It was my created name. It was the thing that made me, me. It was the name of my soul. And in that instant, I knew that I was in the presence of God who was outside of me and next to me, but I couldn't see God. And I heard my voice. I heard the voice inside me. And the voice had no, no sound and it had no words and it had no sex. It was not male and it wasn't female. It just was love. And, and I was in filled with um, love and beauty and hope and truth and compassion all wound into one thing. And I knew that instantly I was in the presence of God and, and in the knowing of myself as a being, as a created being, I knew all the pain that I'd given everyone in my entire life. I knew all the love that I'd given everyone, but more importantly at this time, uh, which was timeless by the way, this is a place of timelessness and no thing and no space, or no dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I suffered all of the pain that I'd given everyone in my entire life. It was like a, a life review of all of the bad things that I had done to, to hurt people. And I felt their pain. I didn't feel as if I was feeling their pain. I felt their actual pain. And it was cumulative. And it was every single person I'd ever caused pain to. And particular people stood out like my sisters. Um, and my sister Cynthia in particular um, featured because I knew her longest and best. And all the times that I'd hurt her with intent and all the times that I'd hurt her without intent. And all of it was immensely painful to me. And, mm -hmm. and I judged myself as shameful for having caused this pain to them because in the presence of God, it seemed so ugly to me, this pain that I'd caused, and that God was so beautiful, and my humanity had caused other humanity to suffer. So this, I mean, this, this being was displaying to you, reflecting back at you that the pain that you had caused and your vision is 360 degrees. You can see everything around you and your mind is capable of absorbing all this information, knowledge. And yet you're looking back through your human life and you're reviewing all the pain that you caused. Yes, and I didn't cause myself to review my life. It was done to me. And it was, it was, I know you is what God kept saying to me. I know, I know you. I know everything about you. There's nothing hidden from me about you. There never has been anything hidden from you about me, uh, from me about you. And I had immense self-knowledge of all the things that I had done. And God kept saying, I love you, I know you, you're my beloved, I forgive you, because I know you, because I made you this way. This is not a surprise to me. I already know you suffered and caused suffering. And I was forgiven for that. Um, not because of anything that I had done, but simply because I was loved. <laughs> And wow. I was ashamed too. I was ashamed. I mean, this is such a powerful, powerful story. And, you know, I'm just, you have this, 
you have this sense of just humbleness in your voice, but you know, it's almost like a supernatural quality as if you know a secret that we all know, but we just don't recognize. And I mean, how did this experience, I mean, was there, was there something inside the experience that, that showed you what you had to do next? I mean, I, I could only see myself in comparison to the divine. It wasn't, it wasn't so much humility as it was a recognition of the immensity of the divine being and love. It, it's, it's not so much, humility isn't this, I, I bow my head before you because you're my brother. It's, it's that I see you as my equal because God is our parent, the one who made us, who is so far beyond us. And, and the comparison of myself to God is like a, a speck of, like a, like, like a molecule floating in the vastness of the universe. And God is the universe and I am just a tiny speck. <laughs> and, and I, I said to God, am I dead? And this is without language. And I said it inside my being, and God said, yes, you're dead. And I said, well, I can't die. And God said, why? And I said, because my sister had vanished, and my parents were suffering greatly for that. My mother had had a bad breakdown. The family was in turmoil for a decade. Andrea, her name, she was at every meal, at, at every Christmas, but we could never mention her name. Because if we ever mentioned her name, my mother would break down. My mother spent every single night for half a decade crying, standing in the living room with the lights off, staring down the street with the curtain pulled back, looking for my sister. Crying herself to sleep every single night. And we, we, we couldn't talk about it because anytime we talked about it, she'd break down. So in order to protect her, we had a rule in our house don't ever mention Andrea and never talk to anyone about her ever in our city. My dad was pretty prominent where we lived and everybody knew something had happened, but we, we were locked down. And so my parents, I watched my mom suffer and my dad get angry. And I said to God, I can't, I can't take another child from my parents. And my God swept me over to see all of earth. I could see every single human being on earth at once. And, and I could see that every single human being like me was beloved, in particular, especially. And that not one of them could see as I could see because they were still in the flesh and they had this veil that prevented them from seeing what I could see. And God said to me, in the way that I love you now, you've always known now. You now know that you've, I've always loved you. And I love you now and I always will love you. And that my love is what you are and what fills you and gives you beauty and, and, and forgiveness and, and makes you special and beloved. And I knew that eternally. I still know that. I don't know it to the, to the immensity because I'm stuck back in this body again. Mm -hmm. but the memory of being loved is overwhelming. And I knew that everyone was loved and God showed me my parents in particular and the suffering they were living in their lives right then. And, and I knew that they were beloved. And because of that love and because of where I was, I knew that all would be well. God said, all is well, all will be well, all has been well because of my love. And he asked me, you know that, don't you? And I, I knew that to the core of my being, that in the end, the suffering that my parents would experience by losing me would end in beauty and joy and love in the same way that I was experiencing it. But, but I could see their faces and I couldn't, I couldn't make them suffer more. So this was, I mean, this was the reason that you came back. You couldn't make your parents suffer more the loss yeah i knew also that the length of my life was the wink of my eye 
that time time is a, is a total illusion, just like space is, and that in eternity, the length of my life amounted to nothing. And so knowing that, I figured that it would be instantaneous for me to come back. But it, it hasn't been that worked out that way. And at least not yet. Maybe when I die, it'll feel that way, but not yet. And so I, I then said to God, you know, I got another reason. Um, and the theater company were on a tour, going on a national tour. We'd been in production for a year, pre-production, going into production, um, 24,000 miles, uh, 64 shows all over the United States, west and west of the Mississippi. And um, I, I, I had made a promise. I'd made a vow to my director that I would not be hurt because we had no understudies. Um, and and I, I said, God, do I have to stay here? And God said, no, you don't have to stay here. And I said, well, if I go back, can I come back here? And God said, yes, you, you can come back here. And for me, that meant the love and the beauty and the joy, compassion, faith, all wound into this oneness in, that was inside of me, that filled me. And I said, can I come back here? And God said, yes, you can come back here. And I said, well, then I choose to live my life. And God said, you won't live your life. And the next thing I knew, I was being screwed back into my body again. It was painful. And I remember wondering what was going on. And I, I swam to consciousness inside my body, but I didn't even know what a body was anymore. I, I was so disoriented. I, I didn't know I didn't know what I was, let alone where I was or who I was. I didn't even know what matter was. <laughs> huh. Wow. I mean, why would you, for me, I mean, how did you, how does a person process an experience like this? I mean, you, well, you just touched the divine and I mean, you're this, 21 year old kid and you've just died you've encountered what you call god and for lack of a better term for lack of a better term I, and uh, i mean it it just it it blows me away i'm still processing it it's it's you know happened in 1980 it's it's 2016 every day i try to figure this out and how old are how old are you now i'm uh, turning 57 tomorrow oh well happy early birthday uh, thank you thank you man. so i mean and, and i mean in, in all of this time you you know you have been sharing your story and well not quite i i kept it a secret for decades and I, I started sharing it publicly about 15 years ago to my congregation. I'm a United Church of Christ minister. I, so, so. Well, wait, wait. What, what made you not want to share it? Because it's crazy. <laughs> okay. So, so I was on that. I, I came, swam back to consciousness, and and I didn't even understand language. And and I, as I swam back up, I I became cognizant as I slowly began to process that that I heard the words, uh, "I thought you were dead. You were dead. Don't die. If you die, I die." And and I it was Tim, my partner, and he helped me back up. And I was completely didn't know who he was or what I was, and and I don't know how long we stood there as I tried to figure out what was going on, and. He, we hadn't talked all night because we were trying to save our energy to survive. Because every time we spoke, our, our, our fuel in our bodies went down noticeably. And, and I pulled on the rope which had been stuck and it came free. First pull, like a miracle. And mm -hmm. we descended. Um, we got into the tent. We treated ourselves for uh, till after sunup, which wasn't that long away. Mm -hmm. um, and then we decided we'd be warmer in the car. So we went and we got the car and... We defrosted. My feet were like ice blocks. My hands were 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 immovable. It, it, 
I can't tell you how cold that was. I like got frostbite, um, fingertips, my toes, my feet, my face. And, and this is after the experience, is your, your back. Yeah. And, and so not only, not only am I trying to figure out where I'd been, I'm trying to save this body that I'm in. And, and then I, the next day was a terrible day. As bad as that night was, it was, it was almost worse the next day. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much away because, because it's in the book. <laughs> but it was really, it ended up with me and Tim splitting up while still in Canada and me having to, uh, at sunup the day following, um, hitchhike back to Bozeman, which is about eight or 10 hours away from where I was. Uh, and, and we used the little money we had left for Tim to take a bus back to Bozeman and I hitchhiked. And um, Tim was extremely angry at me for, for what had happened that day not that night, but the, the day following. And, um, and I remember standing at sun, at sunrise, uh, thinking to myself as I began to process this, because most of the day before I slept, I was exhausted. I just slept in the car as we drove and Tim drove. And, and I, and I, re I remember thinking that the world to me looked like a cartoon. I was trying to figure out, it's like being in a two-dimensional space. I'd been in a, in a four-dimensional space, and now I'm in a two-dimensional space. And it, was, and it was a most beautiful place. The sunrise was gorgeous, and to me, it was not beautiful. Nothing was beautiful anymore. I wasn't beautiful. The, the sky wasn't beautiful. The mountains weren't beautiful. Nothing. It was all like black and white to me, like going from a color world into a black and white world. And I, I knew that something had happened to me, but I didn't understand what. I, I knew it was God, but I didn't know where I had gone. Or So it, it sounds like you had a near-life experience, not a near-death experience. Well, I would call it a death experience. Uh, it's not nothing near about it. When I, was, when I was eight years or six years old, I went swimming in a river, and I went down for the third time, and some guy hauled me out. That was near death. I would have drowned. Um, I almost got knocked off the mountain by a boulder the size of a, of a, of a refrigerator another, on another climb. Um, it swept by me with inches, within inches of me. That was a near-death experience. If I hadn't turned, it would have smacked me in the back and swiped me off the mountain. Um, that would have killed me for sure. This, this was death. And when I came back here to this world, this world was flat and ugly by comparison. And, and most of me was still on, it's still on the other side. And, but in that, in those early days, I was so disoriented and confused that I, I had enough rational capacity to understand that if I talked about it, people might think I was crazy. So, so, you, so you kept it in the closet. I, I locked it down. I didn't tell anybody. And, and I, my career life changed. I went back a, to Montana, um, went off on this theater tour instead of riding around in the 15 passenger van uh, with all of my peers or even driving, which is I was signed up to be a driver. I refused to drive. I took myself off the driver's list. Uh, we also had a pickup truck with a trailer with all our costumes and electronic gear. Uh, I went in the back of the pickup truck with my winter gear and I, I sat in the back of the truck. I didn't talk to anybody. And I, I performed at night. I had, we stayed in people's houses and I was sociable, but I, 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 I went by myself into myself. I and mean, that was, that was my next question. I mean, how did this, how did this affect you? I mean, how did this, this change your life? Well, um, in a, in a practical sense, um, I, I come from an architectural family. My dad had a, uh, a one, a one man, firm, but it was uh, of significance outside of Boston. He was big in the National AIA, uh, American Institute of Architects. And you know, my whole life had been, um, even though I was an English major, my whole life had been oriented towards going into my dad's firm. Um, I'd been drawing my whole life in his office and art classes and was working construction as a carpenter's helper for three or four or five years. I don't really remember off the top of my head. Did it for a long time with the idea that I would go to graduate school in architecture like my sister 
um, who was ahead of me, another sister, and that I'd be able to converse with the blue collar guys swinging the hammer, but I would have the graduate school architectural degree um, and the capacity to um, run a successful business because I could work both ends of the stick. I could design the building and talk to the guys. Um, I came home and uh, I couldn't do that. I ended up going to this monastery this that I mentioned early in our conversation, the monastery near my Catholic school. Uh, I started going there on retreat uh, in order to figure out if anybody could help me. Mm -hmm. um, and thoughts... Were you, were you trying to understand this? I'm trying to understand this. And I'd been meditating already, you know, for three or four years before this happened, and I just dove ever deeper in. Meditation became my my salvation. Um, it became how I, 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 I sat with the contradiction and the paradox of being here and not being from here. Uh, it was turmoil and it was depression and it was darkness and it was isolation and loneliness and alienation and uh, nobody could possibly understand what I'd been through. Nobody could, even if I told them, they couldn't understand it. And I knew that much. And, and so I went to divinity school. And I went to divinity school, um, applied to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and I got into Princeton and Yale, and I chose Yale and because the dean of students took a personal interest in me. And when I got to the div school, I asked her if I could begin to study mysticism, even though it wasn't a primary course or a course at all, uh, a course of studies at Yale, there were a smattering of courses around the university and she let me take them and also she let me take uh, independent study with her so that I could study systematic theological thinking while studying the history of mysticism of the West in order to gain some knowledge of language and experience of those who went before me that I might be able to find somebody like me. Right. And, and so I, I was in Washington over the weekend, uh, this past weekend, uh, uh, doing a, a, a book event, speaking event, and a show, uh, Great Day Washington. And, but my host was a Div student that I had known long ago, and she's a reverend now and has a church down there. And we got to talking, and I didn't know her extremely well when I was at Div school, but I knew her pretty well. And she told me over the weekend that, unbeknownst to me, my Div school friends were talking about me, even my close friends, kind of behind my back because I was an oddity. I never went to chapel. Um, three years of school, I uh, never went to chapel but once because there was a special speaker I wanted to hear. I, I spent my chapel time in meditation on my own. Uh, I, all I did at Div school was study, practice meditation, practice yoga, and play ultimate frisbee. Um, and <laughs> I founded the team with my co-founded it, but, um, I like fun. I still like fun. Um, but I, I, they all thought I was stoned all the time they, because I, <laughs> they're like you, walking around. She, she, her name's Kathleen. Kathleen says, Peter, you were walking around with this little smile on your face all the time. And, and, and you had such an otherworldliness to you. And all you did was meditate. And wherever you were, if you weren't studying, you were meditating. And if you weren't doing meditation, you were doing yoga. And, and we didn't understand what you were. And you were barefoot all the time. And um, we liked you, but you were an anomaly. And, and, and they didn't know. I mean, I didn't broadcast that I was studying mysticism. I mean, how do you relate to people after an experience like this? And did you, were you, did you feel kind of isolated in... After your experience, I was isolated. I still am. Um, the way I figure near-death experience people like me are is we're our own tribe. Um, we live in these two different places all the time, and and yeah, in those early days, it was very difficult. I, I lost my high school sweetheart over this. Um, she she couldn't. I loved her too much. You ask me how I dealt with people. I love them. And that's, that's my, my connectivity with them. But, but I was too intense for her and too distant. I, especially those first few years, I, I spent so much time in meditation. And 
that when I wasn't in meditation, I was still in meditation. Were you open with her or did yeah. you keep it from her as well? I, I, I didn't tell anybody, no one. I told my wife, uh, the woman I married, which was um, years later when I was at my between my second and third year of div school, um, I told her on the night before our wedding. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like if I have any regrets at all, and, and uh, it's that. It's that I was completely unfair to her. I mean, it's not like she didn't know that I was strange already. Um, it, weird things had been – she'd seen weird things. Um, like, uh, like, like one day the northern goshawk – I was out bird watching um, outside of Boston. There's a there's a green belt outside of Boston. It runs from the North Shore to the South Shore. It's in between 128 and 495. And I was in this very large uh, town um, park forest that was connected to all these other state parks and town forests. And it was, it was a big area, but but I was in a small part of it. Bluebird, looking for eastern bluebirds, and by myself meditating while I walked in the woods. And, and I got attacked by a northern goshawk that chased me for miles, knocked me to the ground. I wrestled with this thing. <laughs> um, weird stuff, weird, weird animal things, weird, weird other things. Um, just... I, what do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, from my point of view, I'm back in the infinite darkness again, having a, a divine experience. So you still have a link to this? I still have a link to this. I can't unlink it, and and by God, I tried to unlink it. Because it's it's been it's it's functioned in my life as a blessing and a curse, and for most of my life it felt like a curse. And only now, in the past several years, the last this past August in particular, but a couple of events that have happened in the past several years have made me more integrated enough here that I that I can stick around and not feel so bereft of. So I mean, what would you say to a person that might be listening to this that has encountered something like you experienced? I mean, and are kind of keeping keeping them keeping it to themselves. What would you say to them? I would I would say that it's not 1980 anymore, and that you can talk about it. You can find people you can talk to about it because I think that one of the things that happened to me is that is is that by keeping it a secret to myself. It twisted inside of me. You know, one of the things that I, uh, I have lots of gay friends and we talk about before they were in the, when they were in the closet, when they're out of the closet, when the, when the culture, gay culture was in the closet and when gay culture was out of the closet. And there's this big, huge transitioning going on now where marriage is acceptable culturally and socially and so they don't have to hide anymore and pretend anymore and how being in the closet kind of by lying living a dual life living a dual life can twist a person and i i got twisted a little bit um, by living a dual life um not telling the truth it, it wasn't that i was lying to people other than the fact that i told people that i believed in god which i didn't um as a as a minister um because I don't need to believe in God. Uh, I, I have trouble believing in, in here more than I have in believing in God. <laughs> God to me is the real, and this is, this is the illusion. Um, and so to tell someone who's had a near-death experience or something like that, you know, maybe they were in the operating room and they left their body and they watched the surgery and they, they didn't go all the way down the tunnel or out into the vastness that I went into. Or, or maybe they've had an astral projection dream where they know that they've left their body and that uh, they know that they came back into their body again. Your soul is your body. And I'm thinking that in the 21st century, that's going to become clear through science. The soul is a real thing. And those of us who live in an energetic soul that we feel it, know that this is true. And, and for, for near-death experience people, the body is, is the illusion completely. It's not the real thing. And I'm hoping in the 21st or maybe the 22nd, but hopefully the 21st century, science develops a, a way to see the essence of the human being. 
Um, maybe it's made up of you know, muons. I don't know what it's made up of. I just know that it's real and I hope that science can see it. And so that would give validation to people like me. Definitely, definitely. I mean, there's this conversation has, has flown by, uh, but there, you know, there's an experience that you talk about in your book, Heaven is Beautiful. You talk about a situation where you, you prayed over a badly injured person. Uh, there's a car accident. You, yeah. and I mean, things got a little strange, right? Yeah. How, I mean, well, I left out the, the strangest part. Um, I wrote that part of the book after I'd written the book, when my publisher came to me and said, you know, you need to add something else in that's a little out of this world. And so I, I struggled with what to put in there and I put that in. And, and the, the fellow who's in the book, Brian, he doesn't live far from me. He's one of my best friends. He still lives, he lives up here in Maine still. And, um, he came to me and he said, Peter, I, I read that. I was there. You left out, you left out the strange stuff. And the strange stuff is, that what, hap what happened is this. We we'd been on a retreat. Uh, he was leading a retreat for kids. That was my first beginning of trying to be an, a, a minister in the United Church of Christ. Uh, the dean of students talked me into it. The same dean that let me study mysticism, she talked me into giving this a shot. And um, so I, I went on this, I was a leader on this eighth grade retreat for all these kids statewide. And um, I was, I, I, I Kids, there's this photograph of me from that time where all these kids are clinging all over me. Everybody's leaning into me. I had this radiance that, that, that Brian was talking about. And, and on the drive down back to New Haven, he said, Peter, I, I love you. And um, um, I trust you. And I knew in that moment that I could trust him. And then, you know, we're driving down the road and I look ahead and there's a car flipped over, just happened. It had flipped over and it was upside down on the medium strip on the railing, upside down, raised up off the ground on the, the guardrail in between the two, you know, the north and the south lanes. And there were a bunch of guys were standing there right, doing nothing. And I screamed at Brian to stop the car and he pulled over. I was yelling at him and he didn't, he hadn't seen what had happened on the, on the highway. And I jumped out of the car and I ran across the highway and there were a bunch of guys, soccer players or softball players standing around. They all had cleats on. And I, I shouted out, is anybody here a medical person? And they, nobody was. I said, well, I'm, I'm taking over the scene. I'm an EMT. And um, I, which I technically wasn't, I was a licensed ambulance attendant, but that's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's easier to say it. And, um, and so I took over the scene and I went over to the old man who was lying on the ground and he was semi-conscious and I, I palpated him and, and his, his belly was like rock. And I knew that that meant that he had internal bleeding and bad internal bleeding. And there was really absolutely nothing I could do for him. And so I couldn't treat him for shock. I couldn't lift his legs up because it hurt him too much. And so all I did was I began to pray over him. And I, I put one hand above his forehead and one hand above his chest and I just dropped into meditation and I wasn't praying for healing or anything else. I was just being a channel and, and it was like a lightning bolt came through me repeatedly. It was like the top of my crown opened up and this energy started blasting through me, which swirled my head and, um, and, and it just kept charging through me and, the next thing I knew, the ambulance had arrived and, and the, EM, the real EMTs, uh, paramedics, were asking what was going on to me and I described what had happened. And so I, I took his head into traction while they, they collared him and backboarded him and we lifted him on a backboard under the gurney and they put him in the ambulance and off he went. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I then ran across the street again and with Brian who had come over to see what was going on. There was you know, a lot of commotion and got back in the car and, um, and, and, uh, I began to tell him what it was going on. And suddenly I, I, my interior started to hurt incredibly. Like someone had taken 
uh, a knife and jabbed it inside of my guts and swirled the knife around and just cut everything. And I started screaming in the front seat of the car and swir- uh, squirming, um, screaming like, like in agony. Um, and Brian, poor Brian, was trying to figure out what was going on, and and I was screaming, "Oh my God, it hurts so much!" Ah! And then I couldn't, I couldn't articulate anymore. It hurts so much. It's just, just primal scream. And 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 I opened my eyes, and I I saw the steeple on uh, a local church that we were driving by leap off and strike me in the chest and take my pain away. Mm-hmm. And and of course, the steeple didn't actually do that. The, the cross on the top stayed where it was, it, but that's not what I saw. And then as we drove down, Brian's trying to figure out what was going on, and, and I closed my eyes to rest because it was exhausting me. It had exhausted me. And inside of me, I was back in the outer darkness again, traveling at, at light speed. And in, and in the far distance, the very far distant, horizontal edge, I could see the light, but I was so far away from it. And I was traveling inside myself at, at, at like light speed. And, and this, that experience lasted days, that interior experience of, of being in this other place whenever I closed my eyes. And, and over the next week, a prayer would strike me. It was like, um, a hot, sweet buzz and honey would would enter from my feet and sweep up through my legs and and over my eyes, and I would I would collapse wherever I was standing. I was uh, standing in a in a used auto parts store, or or uh, sitting at my desk in um, Dr. Kelsey's class, or and I spent those three days, and it was like it was like. It was like God was praying inside me. Like I wasn't praying anymore, but the prayer was praying me. And it was wordless. And and I spent the <laughs> three days wandering around completely bewildered, so much so that Brian and um, our friends began, became quite concerned about my mental status. Um, and after three days, the intensity of it, lessened enough so that I went back to class and, um, and, and then Brian came to me and he said, what was going on? And, and because of the conversation that he and I had had before the accident where he told me that he loved me and trusted me, I decided to tell him the truth, what had happened and why why this thing had happened to me and that I wasn't in control of it. And that, that I asked him to keep my secret because I knew that it sounded crazy. I was behaving in a crazy way. And, right. and so I, that's why I was so guarded about it for all these years. And that's not the only thing that's happened. Uh, lots of other stuff. Now, that was the most public thing. Mm-hmm. Other, other, there's been other things that have been other divine experiences that have been less public, but witness i mean in your in your blog you talk about using yoga and mindfulness uh to cope rather than painkillers you had a heart attack where you saw near death you know once again in august i mean uh so that was recently i mean did you five months ago i i i i ran 5k the day before and i was i I didn't go out sailing i have a small sailboat and i was going to go solo sailing because i still like adventure um and but the fog rolled in and so i couldn't go sailing and it was saturday morning so i went to yoga class late and in the middle of this yoga class uh because i got tired of practicing on my own because it was needed the social the socializing um i had a heart attack and i self-diagnosed because i'd been on an ambulance uh, working on an ambulance for all those years and um volunteer um and they rushed me to the hospital and which is an urgent care center where we live now because the hospital closed. And the doc said to me, I can shoot you up with this decoagulant. You have a hundred percent blockage in your widow maker, but if I shoot you up with this, it could kill you. Or it could give you a serious stroke that you'll never recover from. Or it can maybe give you a chance to survive long enough to get to the hospital, uh, which was hour an hour and a half away. Um, I told him to shoot me up. And so he shot me up. 
And I got a trickle through, like a 5% trickle through, he told me. And then they were going to give me morphine um, for the pain because it was a, an immense amount of pain in my heart. And I told him I can't take opiates because they make me sick and um, that I would meditate my way through my pain as I have done, you know, my whole life. Uh, when I can, I, I use my meditation to control my pain. And so my physical pain. So as I was being wheeled out into the ambulance on the ride to the hospital, my son came over to me. Who, he was in town for the summer working and a college student. And he squeezed my hands and looked me in the eye and said, I love you, Dad. And it was only later, a day later, that he told me that the doc, the ER doc, had told him to say goodbye to me, say his last words to me. And so... I'm in the ambulance and I have, I have, I'm in my right mind because I'm not on any medication, painkiller, and I'm meditating. And in my meditation, I see death come to me again. The same, the same being I, as I saw last time. Only this time, it didn't rush at me to take me. It, it hovered around me and offered to take me. And as I looked at death, death came toward me in a gentle way. But when I looked back in my meditation, death receded. And inside my meditation, I could hear my son saying to me, I love you, dad. And I started thinking about my daughter and my granddaughter who had been born um, sometime earlier this year. And I realized that they needed me here. And that I, though I could go, death would let me and take me. I decided to stay once again for love and you know, I've, I've been the best dad I could be. I know I'm not the greatest dad in the world, but I'm the only dad they have. And they still need me. And so I chose to stick around. Although I've been praying for my own death, God take me since the day I came back the first time. Wow. Peter, I mean, this is a beautiful conversation, man. I, I, uh, we are at the end here. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is called Heaven is Beautiful, How Dying Taught Me That Death is Just the Beginning. My guest is Mr. Peter Panagor. Um, Peter, thank you so much for your time and your story, sir. Where can people find your work, your website? Uh, two websites, peterpanagor.com, peterpanagor.com, and dailydevotions.org. I work for Daily Devotions. That's my, my work these days, but peterpanagor.com. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. Happy birthday. Thanks, man. And uh, we'll have you back again next time, the next time that you die. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> God. Thanks so much, Peter. Really, really great conversation. All right. God bless you all. Love is the thing. Love is it.